Welcome to ISJIP Live Journal Club for March 2021. I'm one of your moderators this month, Natalie Binet. I have a co-moderator this month, Kyle Devins, who I will introduce more in just a moment. I just want to briefly touch on upcoming ISJIP Live events uh, for you to be aware of. On March 31st, a podcast will drop at uh, 12 noon Eastern time featuring Drs. Karuna Garg and Amy Jolin Price, and they will be discussing a recent publication about molecular classification of high-grade endometrioid adenocarcinoma or high-grade endometrioid carcinoma, very prescient topic for this month. And then on April 8th, uh, there will be a webinar on challenging issues in the pathology of endometrial carcinoma, featuring the new president of um, ISCHIP, Dr. Uh, Matthias Zhu, and that will be at 15, Hundred Central Eastern Time, 1400 GMT, 10 a.m. Eastern Standard Time. So we're not on daylight savings time anymore. And you can find all this information at isship.ca and register for the events there. And I do have an exciting announcement this month that um, ISCHIP Live Journal Club is going global. So um, ISCHIP Live has been thinking as a, a pr the programming group about how to make these events open to more folks um, worldwide. And one thing that we are all trying to think about is making these events available to people live in different parts of the globe. And um, Dr. Karen Talia has agreed to join me as a um, co-host and will be co-hosts from across the world. So every other month starting in June, Dr. Talia will host. And I've put the schedule down there with the green arrows indicating the journal clubs that Dr. Talia will host. And that will be at 12 p.m. local time in uh, Melbourne, Australia, um, which is also, it's Australian, I think that means Australian Eastern Standard Time. So um, I always try, I put US Eastern Standard Time and now we're Australian because it gets a little confusing. Uh, but if you would like to um, present at one of those or if it's easier for you to be awake during those times, you can always reach out to me and let me know. Um, and then uh, another exciting uh, announcement for ISGIP Live is that there's a new format for presenting for residents and early or trainees and early career pathologists moderated by Dr. Jennifer Bennett from the University of Chicago and she's actually on the um, presenting panel today uh, so she can see what it's like to be on the as a panelist on a webinar and um, this will be a uh, focused at trainees and early career pathologists and it will be a format of presenting interesting gynecologic pathology cases um, and if you would like to present, you can reach out to Dr. Bennett. And if you have a case, you can maybe use a mentor from your own institution if you would like. If you're at an institution where you don't have a gynecologic pathologist as a mentor, Dr. Bennett or someone from ISGIP will serve as your mentor and can even help provide you a case if you would like to walk through one with someone else. So overall, we want to hear from trainees and early career pathologists. The three of us are listed here with our contact information. Please reach out to us if you would like to, or if you are someone who has trainees and would like to encourage your trainees to participate. We do offer mentorship ahead of time. We don't throw you to a live audience without practicing, as anyone who's participated can tell you. So the learning objectives are listed here. I read them every month. I won't read them this month in the interest of time. Um, the other thing is I provide this at the beginning in case anyone take, wants to take a screenshot of it. This is an abbreviated form of the PowerPoint presentation that I provide to the presenters so that they can kind of understand what questions to be asking at different points in the study and in the presentation format if you'd like to follow along in that way. And then, sorry, there's a little lag with my presentation. So these are the three articles we'll be presenting this month and um, they were selected by my co moderator, Dr. Kyle Devins, who is a GYN and GU pathology fellow at Mass General Hospital. And Kyle, uh, Dr. Devins, I will turn it over to you now. Thanks Thank so much, you. Dr. Binet, and thanks for having me this month. I'm excited to be back. I'll now um, introduce our speakers for this month. We have Dr. Agnes Bilex from Semmelweis University in Budapest, Hungary. Our second presenter will be Dr. Maryam Masood, who's from the Department of Pathology at the Royal London Hospital. Then we have Dr. Amani Hassan, who's a lecturer of pathology at Mansoura University. And before we start, um, here's our, our order for today. And I have one more quick point to make if you wanna advance one more slide. Sorry, we're, we're coordinating as best as we can. 
Uh, I just want to note that today's uh, format, uh, we'll be using webinar format, which we've used in the past, but quickly, if this is new to you, you can submit questions using the Q&A button at any time. Those questions will be pooled and we will wait and try to answer those questions, as many of them as we can, at the end of the presentations. Um, we're going to try to let everyone present first so we can make sure we get through everything and we'll address any questions at the end. All right, and with that, uh, and no further delay, we'll start with Dr. Bilex with our first presentation. Thank you. And everyone else, just as a quick note, you can turn your camera off while she's presenting if you'd like. Yeah, so hello everyone. Um, my name is Agnes Bilet, and I am joining you today from Budapest, Hungary. The paper that we are going to talk about today is Endometrial Carcinomas with a Serous Component in Young Women are Enriched for DNA Mismatch Repair Deficiency, Lynch Syndrome, and Poly Exonuclease Domain Mutation. And this paper came out last year in the American Journal of Surgical Pathology very interesting uh, quote, pair of quotation marks around serious that they point, point out. So before we start with the paper, let's do a quick review um, of the classification of endometrial carcinomas. Um, so historically, we have known type 1 and type 2 um, <clears throat> endometrial carcinomas, and this was based on um, morphology mainly. Then in 2013, the TCGA project uh, published their uh, molecular classification of endometrial carcinomas, and this landmark study um, established the four uh, molecular clusters of endometrial carcinomas uh, that we know uh, all know today, and that uh, were very effective in stratifying patients into prognostic groups that we can see here. So the authors of the present paper note that younger patients were underrepresented within the, uh, the serous uh, carcinoma subcohort of the TCGA study, and that uh, serous carcinoma is an exceptionally rare diagnosis in uh, younger patients. And also that reproducible morphology-based uh, classification of high-grade endometrial carcinomas uh, is a challenge. So they have two main, uh, main hypotheses. One, that a subset of serous-like endometrial carcinomas uh, would represent a high-grade endometrioid endometrial carcinoma rather than a genuine serous carcinoma. The other uh, is that serous carcinomas in younger patients would show an intermediate morphology and molecular phenotype between, I mean, intermediate between endometrioid and serous. Then to answer these questions, the authors of the paper um, collected cases from the Memorial Sloan Kettering Cancer Center, and they had two inclusion criteria. One, that patients were younger than 60 years, and the other was they had the diagnosis of endometrial serous carcinoma or a mixed endometrioid and serous carcinoma. In total, the authors collected 37 cases and then uh, reviewed the age and age slides of the cases and looked for endometrioid features listed here. So squamous metaplasia, hyperplasia in the background, and a low-grade component of the tumor. And also serous features were noted with marked atypia and the known uh, architecture of serous carcinomas. Then also immunohistochemistry was carried out for P53, the mismatch repair proteins, ARID1A and P10. And then poly mutation testing was uh, carried out in uh, 25 of the cases. And this testing covered eight of the um, most common pathogenic uh, mutations in the exonuclease domain of poly. And these tests uh, basically cover the four main, uh, the four uh, clusters of uh, endometrial carcinomas that we know since the TCGA study. Um, then let's go uh, to the results. The authors uh, present pictures of the cases. In the first case, we see uh, on the left-hand side, the endometrial uh, glandular differentiation, and with a sharp border, uh, it comes to the serous component of this tumor. 
and the corresponding um, areas in the P53 uh, staining um, um, are very well dem demarcated and we see a geographic pattern aberrant expression of P53. And interestingly, this case turned out to harbor a poly mutation. And here we see uh, the next case. It shows a um, completely serous differentiation and the same tumor has a wild type uh, P53 expression. And what's more interesting or uncommon is that the uh, expression of MSH2 was completely lost in this case, uh, as was MSH6, uh, and the patient turned out to have Lynch syndrome. The authors summarized their findings in a rather complex table, but uh, uh, let me guide you through this. So each line represents one of the 37 cases, and these were grouped into three groups based on mendometrioid features, so morphology, and also um, the MMR status and the poly mutational status of the tumors. So it was also combined with, with molecular uh, properties. Um, all the, MS, uh, the MMR deficient tumors and poly mutant tumors were grouped into group one, and all of these tumors exhibited endometrioid features. And all the tumors that had endometrioid features, but was MMR proficient or poly wild type, uh, was included in group two, also uh, called mixed serous and endometrioid carcinomas. And all the uh, tumors that uh, had no sign of endometrioid differentiation were included in group two, group three, um, and also called pro prototypical or pure serous carcinomas. Um, all the uh, tumors with endometriate features were uh, diagnosed as uh, mixed serous and endometriate carcinomas. And this meant a revision of the original diagnosis in nine out of the 25 cases. So let's look at the P53 um, patterns expression of these tumors. Here we can see that uh, the wild type expression or at least partial wild type expression was very common in group one but it was um, uncommon in the group two and three tumors because this showed uh, mainly aberrant expression. Then if you look at the P10 uh, status of the tumors, in, it's interesting that uh, P10 loss was obser observed in all three groups and it was most common in group three, uh, the so-called serous carcinomas. And in group three, we see that these tumors presented at higher stages compared to group one and group two tumors. So if it summarize the findings in this table, uh, we can see that 16% of the cases shown MMR deficiency and 16% of the test, the, the tumors tested for poly uh, mutations were mutants. So it was a high uh, percentage of these cases. And we see that uh, the serous carcinomas um, in this table um, showed an interesting immune phenotype. 16, 66% of, uh, of the cases uh, had a coinciding P10 loss and aberrant P53 expression. Then the authors carried out a survival analysis of the patients. And we see that in the group one uh, um, cohort, sub cohort, there was no event. So the outcomes were very good. And compared to the merged group two and three tumors, the difference was statistically significant. When comparing uh, the three groups separately, uh, the difference um, was not reaching significance. So in the discussion of part of the uh, paper, the authors note that uh, MMR deficiency, Lynch syndrome and poly mutations are enriched in carcinomas with a serious component in younger patients. And these tumors exhibit a rather um, uh, typical morphology with uh, prominent heterogeneity, uh, foci of serous-like atypia and tumor infiltrating lymphocytes. And this, these, are, these findings are in line with the literature data. The authors also note that a high percentage, 36% uh, uh, of the tumors was reclassified as mixed serous endometrioid uh, based on the presence of endometriate features. Um, 
this um, high rate of disagreement or um, um, is, is also noted in the previous literature. And the authors recommend that uh, young patients with the, with the tumor exhibiting uh, serious uh, components should be tested for poly mutations and the immunohistochemistry for MMR proteins should also be performed because these um, patients are very likely to respond well to immune checkpoint inhibitors. And also they present an, um, this hypothesis that uh, the um, aberrant P53 uh, expression and coinciding loss of P10 expression uh, could um, suggest that these tumors progress from an underlying endometrioid component. And this is, this is uh, um, distinct, a distinct feature of uh, serious carcinomas of the younger patients. So I prepared a list of strengths uh, of the study and it's a very detailed characterization of a very rare entity that includes morphology, immunomolecular and survival data. And it's a novel idea to suggest that high-grade endometrial carcinomas of the younger patients is a distinct subset of endometrial carcinomas unaccounted for in the type 1, type 2 uh, classification and the TCGA cohort. And this study puts further emphasis on molecular testing in endometrial carcinomas and raises awareness of the importance to look for discriminatory endometrial features in our cases. Um, areas for improvement. Uh, so after reading this paper, I, I was still unsure if these uh, tumors presented here had a serous component with quotation marks or genuine serous component. And I noticed that uh, the cases with MMR deficiency and poly mutations were not uh, reclassified as high-grade endometriate carcinomas. And I would very much like to hear more about uh, this decision that the authors made. And also, it would be uh, very interesting to see uh, a higher number of cases because it this would enable a multivariate analysis of factors influencing survival, which is very, it, it would be lovely to see. And I would much appreciate further details on morphology, the ratio of components, and if they are admixed or spatially distinct, and also an extended molecular panel to um, compare these uh, carcinomas to the TCGA clusters. And the applications uh, that we learned from this study is that the serous carcinoma exists in uh, young patients, but it's exceedingly rare in this population. And these are enriched for MMR deficiency and poly mutations. So molecular testing uh, is, is uh, very important in this uh, clinical setting. And <clears throat> that geographical uh, or focal aberrant P53 expression might also be suggestive for MMR deficiency and poly mutations and that P10 loss is frequent in serous carcinomas in younger patients. Um, and with this, I would like to thank you for your uh, attention and back to you, Kyle. Thank you. Thanks so much, Dr. Blesch. That's a, a lot of information and you summarized it very well. So I appreciate that. Uh, you can stop sharing your screen, perfect. And we'll actually bring up our questions now. launch the poll. Awesome. So the poll it should be launching on your screen now. You should have the option to answer. We'll give you a few minutes to answer these questions um, while we go. The, the first one is, which of the following is true regarding P53 immunohistochemistry and endometrial carcinomas? And you can see your answer choices there. And the second is, which of the following accurately summarizes the study findings? So again, we'll give you a few minutes to answer, then we'll address both of these questions. And while you're waiting, just a reminder that you're, uh, you can post questions in the, using the Q&A button at any time. Um, again, we'll get to these questions at the end as we have time, but you can post them at any point. You can also upvote other questions that you find interesting. Maybe a few more seconds and I'll 
close the polls. People are rushing to answer. Okay. <laughs> now we will share the results. So you can see those, right, Dr. Devins? Yes, I can see them. Great. So again, that first one, which of the following is true regarding P53 immunohistochemistry and endometrial carcinomas? Uh, the answer is that MMR deficient tumors can show uh, aberrant P53 expression. This is an important um, point to note. Both poll E tumors and MMR deficient tumors can actually show aberrant P53. Um, and a number of them in this study did so. And as you can see in this study and has been, has, has been shown in prior studies, uh, P53 is actually thought to be a secondary event in these cases. Again, there were multiple cases within this group where P53 overexpression was uh, seen in um, a, a biphasic pattern with a portion of the tumor showing wild type and a portion showing aberrant P53 expression. And it's thought that pol e and MMR deficiency actually drive prognosis in these tumors. So these tumors will still do better. And as a result, um, aberrant P53 expression uh, does not occur exclusively in serous carcinomas, as we have perhaps previously thought. And as for the second uh, question, which of the following accurately summarizes the study findings? Um, there are multiple po main points to the study, but one of them is uh, answer B, which is mixed endometrioid and serous morphology is common in pol e and MMR deficient tumors. So that may be a clue that you're dealing with one of those neoplasms. Uh, again, both pol e and MMR deficient tumors show better overall survival. And as we saw in this study, a number of um, serous carcinomas, even after undergoing all of this extensive testing, we had some pure serous carcinomas occurring in patients under 60. Um, but the fact that the patient is young should cause you to consider um, Lynch syndrome, pol e MMR deficiency. Okay, I think that's good for those questions. At this point, we'll move on to our next presentation. So Dr. Masood, feel free to open up your video and share your screen when you're ready. I think you're still on, you're still muted, Dr. Masood. Yes, can you see me? Can you hear me? Yes. Yep, we can see and hear you. Thanks. Perfect. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, so um, uh, my name is Mariam. I'm one of the registrars working at the Royal London Hospital in uh, United Kingdom. Um, and I just before I start, I just wanted to say a big thank you very much to um, Dr. Bonet and uh, Dr. Devins for all his um, and her efforts um, in uh, you know, getting the um, global community together, I, I think it's really admirable. Um, and um, yeah, I very much appreciate it. Um, so without further ado, um, so I'll be presenting um, this article called Endometrial Gastric Type Mucinous Lesions, uh, which was published about a year ago now uh, in, the, in the very um, well-respected American Journal of Surgical Pathology. Um, and it, uh, essentially it's a case um, series which illustrates the spectrum between benign and malignant lesions. And um, it was published by Wong et al. Um, this publication includes uh, a lot of um, eminent um, gynecological pathologists, um, including um, Professor McCluggage. Um, and um, just to give a bit of a historical perspective, um, historically we've got a, we've had a very good uh, understanding and recognition for such um, gastric type mucinous lesions within the cervix. Um, so ranging from LEGH to uh, atypical LEGH and adenocarcinoma. Um, what this uh, paper brings uh, bring highlights really is um, benign gastric type mucinous lesions and adenocarcinoma within the endometrium. Um, I've just shown some uh, micrographs which I've uh, which were in, present in the paper. And uh, firstly, you can see the benign um, gastric type mucinous lesion, which has a very well lobulated architecture. There's abundant uh, clear cytoplasm and uh, basal nuclei. Uh, on contrary, um, the adenocarcinoma case shows a more destructive um, architecture uh, with abundant uh, nuclear atypia. So um, the aim of 
is really threefold. Firstly, it describes the um, spectrum of gastric type mucinous endometrial lesions. It provides um, diagnostic criteria based on morphological features and immunohistochemistry. And lastly, it hypothesizes that benign slash atypical gastric mucinous lesions may indeed be putative precursors of, uh, of adenocarcinoma. And just to um, show some more, more micro photographs from the paper, um, at the top you can see the benign lesions, which again, um, as described earlier, have a very nice, well circumscribed, very lobulated architecture uh, with no cytological atypia and abundant clear cytoplasm. Um, and um, here at the bottom, you can see a more destructive lesion. So up until the time of this publication, there had been some scattered case reports describing this entity within the endometrium, uh, but really this um, article was the, um, the, the, the first to re bring um, attention to it, and it was a uh, multi-continent um, uh, effort to do so. Um, in terms of the methods, um, they had a very stringent um, inclusion criteria. So uh, morphological features, as I described, clear abundant cytoplasm, and they ensured that there were no typical um, you know, conventional endometroid features. And also they excluded any uh, cases where there may have been cervical involvement to exclude the possibility of cervical metastasis. Well, metastasis from the cervix to the endometrium. Um, and then in terms of immunohistochemistry, they um, ensured that there was positivity for at least one of the gastrointestinal markers, uh, which included either MUC6, CDX2, or CK20. They also ensured that there was less than 5% ER positivity, again, to exclude the possibility of a conventional endometrioid uh, carcinoma. Um, a battery of immunohistochemical tests were conducted uh, on various of these uh, various um, cases, which included PAX8, CK7, CEA, chromogranin, and napsin A, as well as P53 and P16. So these were interpreted uh, in within 50% thresholds, uh, with the exception of P53 and P16, which we would interpret as we do in daily practice. So for the remaining immunohistochemistry, Stains, um, if there was more than 50%, it was called strongly positive. Between 150 was focally positive and zero was as expected negative. Um, additionally, next generation sequencing was conducted in two of the cases. So um, results, um, there were a total of nine cases uh, of which four were adenocarcinoma and five were benign lesions. Um, and uh, the median, uh, sorry, the mean age was slightly higher in the malignant population at 65.5 versus 57.8. Um, and in the malignant population, two of the patients had a history of hormonal treatment, including previous breast cancer. Um, and interestingly, one patient also had a history of congenital adrenal hyperplasia and um, malarian anomaly. Um, they did follow up for these patients as well. Um, and within um, the patients with adenocarcinoma, um, two out of four of the patients died within three years. One was alive, uh, but with widespread metastasis. And the last patient was alive without disease at seven months. Um, there was follow-up provided for two of the patients with benign mucinous le lesions, and they were both alive um, without disease um, between one to three years. Um, so they provided very nice clear tables um, to depict um, the um, pathological features of both the malignant and the benign populations. Um, here, table two depicts the pathological features of endometrial gastric type adenocarcinomas. And um, what the thing that's very striking is that the FIGO grade is below, it, it's between one to two. And uh, nonetheless, the outcomes are actually um, quite significant with um, a lot of patients, the majority of patients having metastasis and half of the patients dying um, within a very short period of time, um, despite the fact that lymph node metastases were not identified in three out of the four patients. And similarly, they provided um, results for the benign mucinous lesions as well. And what we see here is that four out of um, the six patients had um, LEGH-like morphology, which is very interesting. Um, and also um, that there were few of the patients did have some mild cytological atypia as well. So 
sorry. Um, and just in terms of the immunohistochemistry, um, we see that in the adenocarcinoma um, samples, um, there is uh, two out of the four patients show uh, mutation type um, staining for P53. And also there's block type positivity in P16 within the adenocarcinoma patients, which none of which is, is seen within the benign um, components, well, sorry, within the benign population. Um, and then uh, another point to raise is that next generation sequencing showed smark b one missense mutations in two of the cases, one malignant and one benign. And lastly, RB1 nonsense mutation was seen in one of the adenocarcinoma cases. So uh, lastly, the paper showed a very nice um, table, which I've um, tried to demonstrate here with pictures um, taken from the paper. And these um, they provided these very good um, proposed diagnostic criteria and terminology for endometrial gastric type mucinous lesions. Um, so what they are hypothesizing is that um, you have a spectrum ranging from mucinous uh, metaplasia of gastric type at the benign end, and at, uh, between you've got the atypical mucinous metaplasia, and lastly endometrial gastric type adenocarcinoma. The photographs provided um, show um, very um, little to no there is no cytological atypia within the benign component uh, and there's abundant clear cytoplasm. As we move across, we see um, that there's a beginning of cytological atypia and maybe loss of um, globular architecture. And lastly, within the adenocarcinoma, we see this destructive um, lesion with a lot of cytological atypia. Um, They've said that we require um, presence of at least one GI marker, as described earlier as well. Um, and um, in terms of the adenocarcinoma, in order to diagnose it, we need to exclude other primary sites, such as colorectal or endometrial, um, sorry, um, not endometrial, sub, um, cervical um, lesions. Um, as well as that, we need e ER um, less than 5%. Um, and as already described, GI marker positivity of at least one marker. So the um, the paper raises the the requirement really that we need both morphology and immunohistochemistry um, to make a diagnosis of um, endometrial gastric type adenocarcinoma, uh, as well as um, exclusion of um, other primaries with clinical correlation. Um, and um, they raise numerous pathological pathogenetic hypotheses, including TP53 and RB1 gene mutation. Um, and they noticed that there is Mark B1 gene mutation uh, in one of the benign and one of the malignant cases, but this may be of uncertain significance. Um, the fact that um, similar cases of um, primary vaginal gastric type glandular lesions have been seen in uh, patients with malarian anomaly is quite interesting. Um, and also it was interesting that none of the patients had pertz jaeger syndrome. Um, of course, um, because of the rarity of this disease, um, the, there is some limitation due to the small sample size, but um, this has been a multicentric study across the world to try and gain as many um, cases as possible. And uh, furthermore, the paper recognizes the complication of synchronous neoplasms and ensures that not only do we use clinical correlation, but we also have um, good grossing skills as well. Um, and I thought this was a really nice paper which um, correlated morphology with um, clinical outcome very nicely and provided really good, um, in, really good pictures and really good explanations and the tabulated form was very clear. Um, and to date, it is the largest study on endometrial gastric type mucinous lesions. And it, it, it is a seminal article as it is now, this entity is now recognized within the uh, WHO book, which was published last year. Um, of course, uh, there was a limited number of um, pati patients, but this was due to the rarity of the disease. And I think it would be interesting to um, have more molecular um, studies, including next generation sequencing um, as we look forwards. Um, for As a trainee, I thought this was a really interesting um, disease, um, particularly the adenocarcinoma, because it may have a very bland 
appearance, but has a very pathologically aggressive behavior. And for me, that is the most really important thing to take home. Uh, so it's important not to dismiss this, uh, particularly in the benign cases where it may just be dismissed as benign mucinous metaplasia. And also, uh, of course, important to have a good MDT discussion with your clinicians to exclude the possibility of other carcinomas. Um, and furthermore, the paper does raise the possibility of whether we should be um, having uh, more follow up for patients with malaria anomalies to make sure that they do not go on to progress such an aggressive uh, carcinoma. Thank you very much. I hope that was all clear. I'm happy to answer any questions. Thanks so much, Dr. Masood. Uh, great summary of, again, a uh, complex topic. And while Dr. Benet is pulling up the, um, our polling questions, uh, I just liked how you touched on, you know, this is a rare lesion, but as you said, it could potentially have uh, implications for patients. I mean, just like the cervical counterpart, these patients seem to do poorly. So definitely something for us to at least be aware of, even if we, you know, rarely or perhaps never encounter it ourselves. Um, okay. You should have your questions popping up on your screen. Yes. So again, we'll give you a few minutes to answer those. Um, the first one is which of the following is true regarding P53 immunohistochemistry and endometrial gastric uh, lesions included in the study? And the second is which of the following is considered in the study to be an immunohistochemical marker of gastric differentiation? We'll give you a few minutes to deal with those. I'll just do a few more seconds and then we'll end it. Sounds good. Looks like most people have voted, so. Awesome. Here are the results. Okay, great. So uh, the first question is really getting at identification of these uh, tumors. So, you know, all of us know that with endometrioid carcinomas, um, you can have mucinous differentiation. So the point of this question is to really distinguish these gastric type mucinous lesions from uh, endometrioid carcinomas. So as noted in the study, there should be less than 5% uh, nuclear positivity for ER uh, in, in gastric lesions, and you should not see a, a well-defined endometrioid component. Uh, and again, you know, just for the purposes of the study, trying to define this as um, a primary in the endometrium, um, they did not include uh, tumors that appeared to be arising in the cervix, which is a well-known uh, phenomenon for gastric type carcinomas. And then for the second question, um, a specific marker of gastric differentiation uh, would be MUX6. Uh, the study mentioned CDX2 and SATB2 as um, immunohistochemical marker markers, which suggest uh, a GI type uh, mucinous differentiation, um, but MUX6 is really specific for the um, gastric uh, type mucin. Okay, with that, let's move on to our last presentation and then we'll get to any questions that we have. So Dr. Hassan, if you wanna uh, turn on your screen sharing and unmute yourself, you can go ahead and take over. Can you see my screen? Yep, we can see it. Uh, hello. The article I'm going to discuss today is mesonephric uh, like carcinoma of the endometrium, a subset of endometrial carcinoma with aggressive uh, behavior. Uh, the article uh, is uh, published uh, recently in the American Journal of Surgical Pathology. Uh, the authors all belong to the MD Ca uh, Anderson Cancer Center. So the mesonephric carcinoma of the female genital tract, they arise uh, from the remnant of the recrest mesonephric or Wolfian duct and the most commonly described in the cervix. Mesonephric like carcinoma is a recently described entity in the latest WHO. They are carcinomas that share the histologic, immunohistochemical, and molecular features of mesonephric like carcinoma, but lack an association with mesonephric remnant, the hyperplasia, and or topographical location associated with mesonephric remnant. 
Less than 50 cases are primary in the uterus have been published. Because of their rarity in combination with a propensity to have multiple architectural patterns, mimicking more commonly encountered tumors, that they continue to pose diagnostic challenges. Uh, the most description of mesonephric light carcinomas are limited to case reports and the small series, so the information about tumor behavior is limited. In this study, the authors describe the clinical, pathological, and molecular features of 23 endometrial mesonephric light carcinomas with emphasis on tumor behavior. They undergo search through the database of the Department of Pathology at the MD Anderson Cancer Center using the keywords mesonephric and uterus, factors used to infer a uterine origin, one or more of the following, the growth description of an endometrial tumor, pelvic imaging study demonstrating an endometrial primary, absence of a dominant cervical tumor and or absence of mesonephric remnant or hyperthesia. They first evaluated the hematoxin hemato hemato and eucina slides so first for the architectural pattern. The tubular pattern is defined as a small round, uh, closely uh, packed uh, client lined by single layer of flat to cuboidal uh, cells. The ductal glandular pattern is tended to have wider, more ovoid glands lined by pseudostratified columnar cells. Uh, the papillary pattern is shows medium-sized fibrovascular cords with three floating cells. And the ricci form pattern shows slit like elongated uh, branching glands lined by cuboidal or flattened cells. The solid pattern shows no glandular structure with the same uh, histology similar to the glandular areas and tend to merge with these glandular structures. The glomeruloid uh, pattern, a form of dilated uh, glandular structure with intraluminal crepiform structure attached to the luminal border. There were also the six cord like torbicular pattern and the sieve like pattern. Then they evaluated the cytological features like the chromatin quality, the nuclear contour, the absence or uh, presence of nuclear grooves and overlaps, squamous or mucinous differentiation, features of clear cell carcinoma or serous like features. They counted the number of mitosis per 10 HPF. They evaluated the presence or absence of dense intraluminal eosinophilic secretions, uh, socially present. present to see slides evaluated uh, as the focal, PHG or uh, diffuse, ER and ER evaluated at the percentage of the nuclear staining. If uh, some cases has uh, had an incomplete IHC result, uh, so underwent the staining for TTF1 and or GATA3. Mutational analysis were available in uh, nine cases uh, obtained from medical, uh, the data obtained from medical reports. In eight cases, they have unstained the slides, so underwent DNA extraction and sequence. They formed two control uh, groups, the low-risk histologic group, this is endometrial carcinoma, phyto grade one or two, and the high-risk histologic group, uterine serous carcinoma. Uh, they formed these groups for comparison with mesonephric-like carcinoma regarding the instance of the uterine risk factor for advanced stage and adverse outcome, progression-free survival, and overall survival. The results, uh, they found uh, 23 cases. Three cases had primary diagnosis of mesonephric-like uh, uh, adenocarcinoma at the MD Anderson Center, Cancer Center. 20 cases uh, were consult or referral cases. 18 cases had initial diagnosis other than mesonephric-like carcinoma. 10 cases endometrioid carcinoma FICO grade 1 and 2. Three cases endometrioid carcinoma FICO grade 3. Four cases adenocarcinoma NOS and one case serous carcinoma. The H and E evaluation varies to the architectural pattern. All cases had at least the two architectural patterns. The most commonly frequent pattern is the ductal glandular and the tubular pattern. And the, this architectural pattern tended to be mixed and merged, merging with each other. Uh, second, the cytological uh, atypia. Uh, the level of cytological atypia was mild cytological features. The level of cytological atypia was mild to moderate. The mitotic index ranged from 3 to 28 per 10 high power fields. The nuclear features uh, similar to those of papillary thyroid carcinoma were found in the majority of cases, at least the focal. Nuclear overlap in 22 uh, cases, nuclear groups in 18 cases, open to vesicular chromatin in 16 cases. Here is an example of a case that show nuclear overlapping and the clearing with the nuclear angulation. And this case that show prominent intranuclear, uh, uh, prominent nuclear grooving. Uh, these uh, nuclear features tended to be prominent with the ductal uh, glandular uh, pattern and papillary pattern. 
The serious light feature is increased nuclear activity and loss of nuclear polarity was present at least focal in 11 cases and hopneal type cells or cytoplasmic clearing were present in four cases. The intraluminal eosinophilic secretion was present in 21 cases, at least the focal. The IHC result, the CD10 was positive in 10 out of 10 cases. The positivity tended to be apical or aluminal in all cases. Carotenone positivity, nuclear and cytoplasmic was noted in five out of 15 cases. Regarding hormone receptor expression, uh, the ER um, was positive in six out of uh, 21 cases. Uh, the PR was positive in only one case out of 15 cases. The cases positive for ER, the percentage of cells um, in three cases, the percentage of positive cells was less than or equal to 10%. And in three cases, it tended to be more than 10%, reaching 40%. One case had uh, both ER and PR expression in 10% of cells. Regarding GATA3 and TTF1, GATA3 was positive in majority of cases, 15 out of 16 cases. TTF1 positive in 11 out of 16 cases. In nine cases, the nuclear intensity and the percentage were more robust for GATA3 expression compared to TTF1. The reverse is, is true for uh, TTF1 in two cases. Four cases show the expression of uh, both markers in inverse pattern, like this uh, picture. Four cases uh, show only GATA3 expression without TTF expression, but no cases uh, show only TTF1 expression. And one case was negative for both. Regarding mutational analysis, uh, mutational analysis were available in uh, 17 cases. 14 cases uh, had the KRAS uh, mutation. Uh, five of them had additional mutation. One case uh, showed beta catenine mutation. Two cases show B10 mutation. And the three cases uh, show PEC 3 ca mutation. Three cases had no KRAS uh, mutation. One of them had the PEC 3 ca B10 and beta catenine mutation. One of them had the CCAT mutation and one had uh, no detectable mutation. Regarding the clinical and uterine adverse risk factor of mesonephric-like carcinomas, uh, the patient age uh, range from 26 to 75 years, uh, 11 cases presented at early stage and 11 cases presented at advanced stage. Lymph node meds were present in five cases, four cases in the pelvic lymph node and one case to the paraortic lymph node. One case had metastatic focus in the pelvic peritoneum, Distant myths at presentation were present in four cases, two, the, two to the abdominal peritoneum and the two to the lung. The tumor size ranges from 2.1 uh, to 13 centimeter. Outer half of my nuclear invasion present in 20 cases, about 90%. Cervical stromal invasion present in seven cases, about 33%. And lymphovascular space invasion in 16 cases, about 76%. In comparison to the low-grade endometrial carcinoma group, the uh, mesonephric-like carcinoma tended to be uh, have uh, significantly more cases that presented at advanced stage with more adverse uterine risk factors. Uh, the similar is true for uterine serous carcinoma, uh, except that uh, they have similar rate of presentation at advanced stage as the serous carcinoma tended to be uh, through the intraperitoneal route uh, more than um, lymphovascular. Uh, for regarding uh, treatment, the 20, 20 patients, about 95% of mesonephric like carcinoma, had adjuvant therapy. The most common modality is combination of chemo and radiotherapy. Regarding low grade endometrioid carcinoma, nearly half of the cases had no further uh, therapy after surgery. And the uh, uh, most common um, form of adjuvant uh, therapy was uh, the vaginal cuff uh, uh, brachytherapy in 25% of cases. In 96 uh, patients of uh, uterine serous carcinoma, about 91, they received adjuvant uh, therapy. The most common modality is combination of chemo and radiotherapy in 48%. Regarding the follow-up, recurrence uh, occurred in 15 cases of mesonephric type carcinoma, about 71%. In uh, 4 to 84 months, the most common site of uh, recurrence is the lung, about 9 cases. Uh, in low-grade endometrioid carcinoma, the recurrence rate was 7.8%, and the recurrence tended to be localized. The most common site of recurrence is the vagina in 11 cases. In uterine serial carcinoma, the risk of recurrence is 28%. Uh, the most common site, the abdominal peritoneum in eight cases, and the retro peritoneal lymph node in seven cases. The median progression-free survival was 18.2 months for mesonephric-like carcinoma, shorter than low-grade endometrioid and serous carcinoma. 
the median overall survival was 70.6 months for mesonephric like carcinoma, shorter than neutrin serous carcinoma, a median OS for low grade endometrial carcinoma not reached. The Kaplan Meyer, Meyer plots for progression free survival and overall survival reveal substantial difference between the three groups, with the mesonephric like carcinoma had the shortest progression free survival and overall survival. On univariate model, the histology, the age, uh, the mesonephric histology, the patient age, tumor size, depth of myometrial invasion, lymphovascular invasion stage, and the treatment were significantly associated with decreased uh, progression free survival and overall survival. And in multivariate model, the mesonephric like histology, the age, and the stage were independently associated with adverse outcome. And those, in addition to lymphovascular employ, are independently associated with disease progression. So mesonephric like carcinoma is a rare type of endometrial carcinoma. The 23 cases in this series show variety of architectural pattern with presence of peculiar nuclear features resembling those of papillary thyroid uh, carcinoma. And at least the focal density is xenophilic intraluminal uh, secretions. Regarding the IHC, the authors advocate the use of CATA3 and TTF1 as the first line uh, markers together with ER and PR. Loss of ER is typically observed in mesonephric like carcinoma. However, the focal expression of ER does not preclude diagnosis in the presence of um, the typical histology and the other supporting IHC markers. The supplemental IHC stains, the CD10 and the carotenin, the advocate, um, uh, the authors uh, didn't advocate uh, their use as first line markers. Regarding KRAS mutation, it's not a universal finding with mesonephric like carcinoma. Although the majority of mesonephric like carcinomas will have KRAS mutation, some will have other mutations that have been associated with endometrioid carcinoma, and up to 17% of endometrioid carcinoma have KRAS mutation. So this finding is not specific to the mesonephric histotype, and the diagnosis of this uh, subtype of endometrial carcinoma remains based primarily on the histologic and the IGC background. The differential diagnosis from other histotypes of endometrial carcinoma, the mesonephric like carcinoma have multiple merging architectural patterns, the presence of tubules with at least the focal dense xenophilic intraluminal secretion is a helpful diagnostic clue, the cytological features of the angulated overlapping nuclei with the open, uh, uh, <coughs> with open uh, uh, clear, uh, with open uh, to vesicular chromatin and occasional nuclear groups, is not a typical feature for either endometrioid carcinoma or uterine serous carcinoma. The use of the first line markers and the, the supplemental IHC markers uh, will support uh, the uh, histologic impression. And the wild type expression of P53 facilitates its distinction from uterine serous carcinoma. The absence of HNF1 beta and NAPSIN A helpful in separation from clear cell carcinoma. Regarding behavior, this is studies underscore the importance of recognizing mesonephric like carcinoma as they have more virulent behavior compared to low grade endometrioid carcinoma and uterine serous carcinoma. And looking at the pattern of recurrence, extra pelvic myths, as well uh, as with the uterine serous carcinoma, are more typical of mesonephric uh, like carcinoma. However, rather than the peritoneal or lymph node the recurrence observed with uterine serous carcinoma, the mesonephric like group had a striking tendency to metastasize to the lung. The phytograding does not apply to the mesonephric like carcinomas, and these tumors clearly exhibit more aggressive behavior than the overall tumor architecture would employ. So the low stage mesonephric like carcinoma shouldn't be equated with the low stage low grade endometrioid carcinoma. The aggressive behavior for some stage one cases suggested that the standard treatment algorithm used for low stage endometrial, endometrial carcinoma uh, may not apply and the treatment algorithm used for a high-grade um, endometrial carcinoma should be considered in this case. So in conclusion, the mesonephric-like carcinoma is an uncommon type of endometrial carcinoma with certain histologic features. Immunohistochemically, the expression of GATA3 and or TTF1 and the absence or market reduction in the expression of hormone receptor facilitate its diagnosis. The majority of cases will have mutation in KRAS, but this is not a universal requirement for diagnosis. The tumor has a more frequent adverse uterine factor compared with the more commonly encountered histotypes of endometrial carcinoma. The presence of mesonephric-like histology is independently associated with outcome, supported both um, 
the need to establish in these tumors as the sanctioned entity, as well as their recognition uh, for clinical purposes. Uh, strengths of this study is a detailed assessment and description of the histologic and immunohistochemical features of mesonephric like carcinoma, the molecular analysis of the cases, and the follow up data with comparison uh, to the uh, control uh, group. Areas of improvement, although the, this tumor is uh, rare, a more number of cases with follow up data would be uh, great. I think uh, searching uh, the database of um, many centers for cases of the uh, low grade uh, endometrioid carcinoma that were uh, diagnosed in uh, the past uh, before the recognition of mesonephric uh, carcinoma and um, uh, behaved uh, aggressively uh, to be revised uh, if there is um, some missed mesonephric like carcinoma cases. So this uh, may yield more uh, cases for research. Thank you. Thanks so much, Dr. Hassan, for bringing us home with that presentation. And um, well, my colleague, Dr. Benet, pulls up our polling questions. Um, just again, you know, I, I think as with all of our sort of, you know, new and hot topic entities that we discussed today, um, asking the why is always important. Why is it important to recognize this? And I think you illustrated that very well. You know, these tumors are scary because, you know, they can look low stage and low grade, but uh, can still have aggressive outcomes. Um, so that's really, you know, why we're trying to increase our awareness here. You can stop sharing your screen, Dr. Hassan, and then I can launch the polling questions. But thank you. Okay, right. so the audience should be able to see those now, and I'll go ahead and pull them up on our PowerPoint. Okay, perfect. And uh, the first question is, which of the following is a characteristic morphologic feature of mesonephric light carcinoma? And then the second is, which of the following immunohistochemical panels would be most useful in the detection of mesonephric like carcinoma? So again, we'll give you a few minutes to answer those. And I see there's a few questions popping up in our Q&A. Um, Feel free to add your questions now as well, if you have any more. And we'll try to get to those with as much time as we have left. We'll give just a little bit more time. Probably gonna end it. Okay. Uh, it's like we've got all we're gonna get. Wow, yeah. there's definitely a consensus on this one. <laughs> uh, so Dr. Uh, did such a great job explaining. <laughs> I guess so. That's awesome. Mm -hmm. um, okay, so again, you know, with these tumors, I think. It, detection really comes down to recognizing suggested morphologic features and confirming with IHC. So the first question is in regards to morphology. And for these tumors, again, you're going to want to see a mixture of architectural patterns, typically, which can include ductal differentiation, most commonly, and then also uh, tubular, papillary, and solid um, architectures. Um, often in the tubular areas, you do see dense intraluminal secretions. And nuclear features uh, similar to papillary thyroid carcinoma uh, are often seen. And again, you don't see other endometri like typical uh, endometrioid features such as squamous uh, metaplasia in these tumors. Um, in terms of immunohistochemistry, uh, the panel advocated by um, our authors in this study is uh, the use of ER, GATA3, and TTF1. So typically, these tumors show a less ER expression. They can be ER negative, and it looked like most of their tumors showed under 40% expression of ER rather than the diffuse ER expression you expect in endometrioid carcinomas. And then um, GATA3 and TTF1 very often show um, sort of an on or off pattern. So some tumors are positive for GATA3 and negative for TTF1. Uh, and conversely, you may have TTF1 positivity and GATA3 negativity in these tumors. So it's really helpful to use both. Okay, so that's it for that. And now with the time that's left, we can try to get to some of our questions. And we do have a few. So just starting at the top from Dr. Mandalia, who I recognize from Twitter. Um, so what percentage of MMR deficient and poll mutant tumors show aberrant P53? Um, I'm not sure on an exact percentage here, but I think Dr. Benet, at least for poll e-mutant tumors, 
you uh, found a nice study here that says uh, from 2015 mod path um, showing about 35% of poll e mutant, uh, poll exonuclease domain um, mutant tumors can actually show an aberrant expression of P53. Um, and again, in these tumors, it's thought to be a secondary event, the P53. So the MMR deficiency or pole exon nuclease domain a mutational status does fuel the um, prognosis in these tumors. Um, the problem with all of these tumors, as everyone knows, is pole E testing is difficult to do um, and is not available everywhere. So that's uh, this really illustrates the problem with that. You can't rely on a P53 um, aberrant pattern to, sh to say that, you know, you don't have a pole E mutant tumor. It could still be pole mutant, pole E mutant. Um, a second one, uh, gastrointestinal type mucinous carcinomas are aggressive. And because they're aggressive, they may extend down into the cervix. And in those situations, how would you decide what is the primary site? That's, that's a difficult question. It probably depends on the, the case. Um, you know, you could see where the majority of the tumor is centered. You could look for that lobular endocervical gland hyperplasia um, to see if you see it in either the cervix or the endometrium, which may suggest, you know, the presence of that precursor lesion may suggest that that's where it arose. Um, but uh, in some cases, I agree, it might be very difficult. And, you know, maybe sometimes you wouldn't really be able to tell. Um, and then final, a PTC like nuclei seen in mesonephric like carcinomas of other sites. Uh, so yes, in the ovary, uh, so ovary, which is the other site where mesonephric-like carcinomas are described, um, similar morphologic features, including the PTC-like nuclei are described. Yeah, and the mesonephric carcinomas of like the vagina, et cetera, uh, they're described as having they don't call them PTC-like features. They say, you know, longitudinal grooves and all the things that are sort of falling into that um, that rubric. And then that second question, I agree, um, it's probably a case-by-case -case basis. And the other thing that's interesting is in the paper where they're writing about the endometrial mucinous lesions, they purposely excluded any that had cervical involvement. So um, <laughs> I, I understand for purposes of publication, that's what they pretty much had to do because I think once the cat's out of the bag, it's going to be a little difficult, especially if it overgrows everything, including like LEGH of the cervix, it would be difficult to tell. So definitely. And interestingly, also in their series, uh, as Dr. Hassan pointed out, um, or uh, Dr. Masood, sorry, uh, they um, none of the patients that they had were uh, associated with Pitsiegers uh, syndrome, which I know is a association we make for. Um, gastric type carcinomas of the cervix, but again, they have a very small number of cases, so that yeah. may not be. Yeah, and they comment in the idea. discussion, of course, you know, Dr. McCluggage had, com had commented about how he had published a series where someone had like a mucinous lesion in their fallopian tube, and then they had, so, you know, they recommend sort of evaluation of the GYN tract in general when you see one of these lesions, because. Great point. Yeah. yeah, that's really good. So I think um, if everyone wants to turn their cameras back on and just um, we can say uh, goodbye and, and on your way out when you leave the meeting participants please fill out the evaluation and um, does anyone have any closing remarks or anything no happy St. Patrick's Day for those here in the U.S. and those who aren't in the U.S. you probably think we're crazy we're all wearing green <laughs> and maybe turning the rivers green in Chicago I don't know <laughs> do they do that in Boston it seems like they would but I don't think they do so I'm not sure this is my first year here so um, I'll have to check the river when I leave <laughs> Okay. All right. Well, thank you all for coming right in the middle of Use Cap Week. I think you all did a wonderful job presenting, and I really appreciate your hard work. We'll see everyone next month. Thank, thank you. you.